sorry, it's, um, we don't have class on Thursday, um, sorry, Wednesday. So this is uh, the only class we have this week. Uh, but we do have class next Monday. Um, so for next week, we only have class on Monday. So that's going to be our last class. Um, and on Wednesday, uh, we don't have class, but I will be in my office to answer any questions that uh, you may have. And I think I already uh, discussed uh, the last exam in the class. So we will, the, class, uh, the, the, the exam will be open from December the 1st to uh, December 7th. So you will have uh, enough time uh, to work on the, on the last exam. And we have one assignment due today. So that's chapter 9B assignment. Uh, before we go back to chapter 12, so we will uh, complete chapter 12 today. Uh, but before doing that, I want to discuss two questions in your assignment. So the first question is uh, question 13. So in, chapter, uh, in that chapter, we were talking about confidence intervals. Two things we discussed. One is confidence interval for the proportion, the other is confidence interval for the mean. So we work on this uh, assignment. First thing you have to figure out is that in this question about proportion or mean. So for question number 13, if you read the question, you will know this is about mean. So it says the mean, so the sample set, they give us a sample size. Sample of 20 purchases, uh, they have the mean, they have standard deviation, and also they give, they give us the data. In part A, so we need to construct a 80% confidence interval for the mean purchase. So here I want to use the stack crunch to do the calculation. So I will open the data table in the stack crunch. Then I go to stat, uh, stat because we are talking about the confidence interval for the mean. So I go with the tstat, one sample. So you can use with data or with summary because in the question, the question told us the, what is the mean, what is the standard deviation. So if you want to use those two, number, those two numbers, uh, you can use the with summary. But also it gives us the data. So I will go with the uh, with data because I, I already opened the data table. So I will just select the data that is given to us. So I select this column of data, then I choose confidence interval. And because the confidence level is 80%, I put uh, 0.8 there. I think that that's all we need to do here. So we click compute. Uh, so we got the lower limit and upper limit. So those are the two numbers that we need. So come to that new places. Let me let me just call this an escape and be careful about the number of decimal places. Two decimal places that can be there. And the upper limit. We got the lower limit and upper limit. This part, what is the margin of error? So how do we calculate the margin of error? of error is equal to the critical value times standard error. So critical value in here, so we are talking about the mean, so that's going to be the t. Then times the standard error. Standard error, what is standard error for the mean? So that's going to be sample standard deviation over square root of your sample size. So that's a, this is the margin of error. So if we go back to the uh, To the upper window. So we have the standard error. That means we have this part and we have the value. We don't have to recalculate this one. But we have to calculate the t 
T value for our critical value. So if you, you want to calculate the T value, we have to get the degrees of freedom, which is sample size minus one. Sample size, we are given the sample size of 20. So degrees of freedom is equal to 20 minus one, which is 19. So we can go to the T calculator to get the critical value. Then we will have the margin variance. Is there any other way to do this calculation? So we can follow the rules. So that, that's the rule, that's the definition. We, are, we, we have this one in the output window, then we just calculate it. Is there any other way to do this calculation? So here is our constant interval. So lower limit and upper limit. This, this is our estimate. Upper limit and lower limit. Let me do this. Uh, no, upper limit is four point eighty three minus the lower limit forty one point ninety six. So it equals uh, seven point. questions on part B. So how we calculate the margin of error. So we just use the difference between the upper limit and lower limit. We know the difference is two margin of errors. So we divide the difference by two, that's, that's margin of error. And the last one, let's say, if you had assumed that the standard, evi the standard deviation of the population was known to be 22, so we are given a population standard deviation. Then what's going to be the confidence interval? So for the first, the part A, we calculated the confidence interval. We we didn't know the population standard deviation. We, standard deviation. we just used the sample standard deviation. Then if we use the population standard deviation, we have a wider confidence interval or a narrower confidence interval if we use the population standard deviation. So if we 
for enough for it, let's, let's leave that question for now. Let's do the calculation. Let's see what, what are the lower limit and upper limits. So let me do, this is open, so let me close this one and do the calculation again. So let's use the stat, <coughs> in this case, let's use the B stat. So when we were talking about constant interval, we said for the mean, for the confidence interval of a population mean, in most of the cases, we do not know the population standard deviation. So we use the T stat or we use the T as the critical value. But, there's a but. In some rare cases, we are given the population standard deviation. In that case, we use the Z as critical value. So this is a very special case. So we use the Z stat one sample. Let's use this summer. Let's use this summer. So stat Z stat, not T stat for this one. Z stat one sample with summer. So here we need to give the sample mean. Sample mean here. We are giving the sample mean forty eight point. 39 standard deviation is so that's the that's the population standard deviation. It's not sample standard deviation anymore. So that's the population standard deviation. Let's put 22 there because that's so that's what is given there. So assume the population standard deviation is 22 sample size, still 20. Constant interval point eight. We have the lower limit and the upper limit. Let's go up a little bit. So this is our original constant interval. So this is the new interval. That's the new interval. We got so the original interval's lower limit is 41 with less than 42. The new constant interval is 42 points. The new constant interval is narrower than the original one. So if we are given the population standard deviation, if we use that information, our constant interval will be narrower because we are given more information about the population. So that's why we don't have to construct a really wide confidence interval to capture the true population needs because we are given more information about the population. We have the true population standard deviation. So that's why we can have a narrower confidence interval. So that's one information that can help us to uh, narrow the, the confidence interval. The other way is let's increase our sample size. Let's increase our sample size. In order to achieve the same confidence level, say 80% in this case, we can increase our sample size. Because the sample size is, is in the denominator. So if this one, so the sample size becomes large, that means this whole value becomes small. Right? So if this one is large, the whole value is going to be small. So that means your margin of error is smaller if you have a larger sample size. But still, we can achieve the same constant level, but we will have a smaller uh, or a narrower constant interval. So that's, that's, that's because we have more information about the population. So one way is to give us the, uh, the population standard deviation, that's good. If we are not given the population standard deviation, if we can select more sample, if we can have a larger sample size, that still means uh, we have more information about the population. So it will give us a narrower confidence interval. So that's uh, how we do this question. Um, so the confidence interval will be a bit narrower, and let's put the number. decimal places. Let's be careful of the decimal places. So that's the whole question. So part B and part 
the so any question on those those three parts? So that's question thirteen, and the last question I will talk about is the question seventeen. So please record it. Uh, the average speed of cars driving on a busy street by a school. So they collected twenty five samples or twenty five bits. Uh, it was determined that the average amount over the speed limit for those samples was 14.5 miles per hour. Uh, that's the sample mean, and we are also given the sample standard deviation, which is 9. And then we are, they did the calculation for us. 95% uh, confidence interval estimate for this sample is, let me put the numbers in here. So the lower we have the lower limit and upper limit. Lower limit is 10.78, upper limit is 18.28. So they did the calculation for us. The question is, what is the margin of error for this problem? So simple, simple question. We are given the lower limit, we are given the upper limit. The difference <laughs> would be Two margin of error. So if we do this calculation, 18 points, 22 minus 10 points, 78, that will give us two margin of error. If we do the calculation, that can be 10.44. So that's two margin of error. Then if we divide it by, divide this value by two, that will give us one margin of error. Okay. Three, sorry. So 3.72. So that's a margin of error. Similar question. So the difficult part is the next one. What sample, uh, what size sample is needed? Reduce the margin of error to no more than plus minus two. <coughs> so initially, this is our margin of error. Now they want to reduce this 3.72 to two. So the new margin of error that we need is we need to achieve this one. We get the sample size. Well, where should we start? Let's assume this this question is, will be on the test. Yes, we need the degrees of freedom 
that's uh, that's one important part for solving this question. Here's the relationship, right? Smart of area is equal to the critical value of t times the standard deviation over square root of n. So here is the one that we need sample size, and here is the requirement. Their requirement. We need to make this one. We need to make this one equal to two. So that's the relationship. We need to get some, some help from this equation. Uh, we got some, some information here. The margin of error that's equal to two. Uh, in order to get this one, we need the critical value. We need the standard deviation. So we do have the standard deviation. So that's going to be so that's nine. So we are given the standard deviation. So that's nine over square root of n. So t or critical value. So in order to solve this equation to get this n, we have to we have to have the t right. Here is a question. We know t distribution has the parameter, which is degree of freedom. Yes, we need the degree of freedom, but the degree of freedom is equal to sample size minus one. So here's the problem. We are looking for the, the sample size. We don't know the sample size. If we do not have the sample size, how do we get the degree of freedom? But if we don't have the degree of freedom, how do we get this one, right? So that's a, that's a dead proof, right? In that case, in that case, let's get rid of this, this one. Instead of using T, let's use V. If we do not have a sample size, let's use V. So still V times the sample standard deviation over square root of n. So we know z follows a standard normal distribution, which means the mean is zero, the standard deviation is one. So we can find the critical value of z. So how do we get the z? Uh, let me use that one. We open the stat uh, calculator. So the confidence level in that question is 80%. We know the critical value of Z depends on the confidence level. It's 80%. Let's put 80% there or 0.8 there. Then let's play compute. The positive number is our critical value of Z. So let me write it over there. So it equals 1.28, let's keep three decimal places. Two times nine over square root of the sample size. So now we have we only have one unknown in this equation. So two equals 1.282 times nine over square root of n. Then the rest of the job is to solve this equation to get the, the sample size. So the key part of this question is to replace the critical value t with the critical value t because we do not know the sample. Uh, we do not know the sample size. We, we don't know the uh, degree of freedom. So let's use the z instead of z. So after we change it to z, then we can calculate the. Spend time on solving this one because I think in the previous uh, chapter 9a assignment, I think we have uh, I think two questions that are similar to, to this one. So we have to solve the 
our equation to get the sample size. Uh, but just in case you forget how to do that, so and the upgrade, upgrade will chapter nine folder. There's a document called sample size. So that's for a different question, but it's also to calculate the sample size. I listed all the procedure for solving the problem, how to find the critical value using step crunch. And the last part is is how we can solve this kind of equation to get the sample size. Although it's different, but if you have difficulties with solving that this kind of equation, you can refer to this part. Okay. So it's under chapter nine folder. So there's a document called sample size. You can refer to that part. Okay. So any questions on part A or B? Chapter nine folder and the chapter nine folder I have uh, I have uploaded a document called constant interval. <coughs> so this in, if you read this in, uh, this document, it shows us um, all the scenarios that we have to consider when we calculate the constant interval. So the for the population proportion, for the population mean, for the population mean. What if we know the population standard deviation? What if we do not know the population standard deviation? which uh, critical value we need to use, and so on and so forth. So it has all the information. So please take some time to read this document. So that's chapter nine, chapter 10. We were talking about uh, hypothesis testing. And I also have a document for you guys and how to calculate the t statistic, uh, sorry, the test statistic, and how we, how we can solve get the t value using flat bounds, and for the population mean, how we can get the, uh, the calculation done in flat bounds. So I have all the information there. So please uh, refer to the document if you have any uh, questions on the calculation. To the chapter 12. So in the last uh, class, we were talking about how we can compare two population means. So in the lecture, we said there are two ways to do that. So one is to calculate uh, or do the hypothesis testing about the difference between population means. So when we do the hypothesis testing, it's just similar to the one uh, population hypothesis testing. So we have to set up our no hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. So in the no hypothesis, we assume that the difference between the two population means is zero. So in most of the cases, we assume that it's zero. But in, for general purposes, so you can use del delta zero. But in most cases, in most of the cases, delta is equal to zero. And for the alternative hypothesis, the competing statement is the difference is not equal to zero or greater than zero or less than zero, depending on uh, the conclusion that we want to make. So that's how we set up the, the hypothesis testing for the difference between two population means. So that's the first way. The next one is to do a constant interval. So we try to use this constant interval to capture the true difference. So we need a constant interval to try to capture the difference between the two population means. So we still need the lower limit and upper limit. And of course, this middle point is our estimate for our sample statistic. And in this case, we still follow the generic 
expression for cost interval. The general expression is estimate plus minus the margin of error. So estimate is y1 bar minus y, y2 bar. So the sample mean one minus sample mean two. So that's our estimate, that's our standard point, the definitive point here. Plus minus the margin of error or critical value times the standard error. Again, the critical value is t, depending on the sample size, degree of freedom. And standard error is square root of sample one, standard deviation square over the sample size one plus sample um, sample two standard deviation square over sample size uh, sample two size. So y one bar, y two bar, those values can be calculated based on our sample data. So we are we have the sample data here, and we can calculate those two values. And for the standard error, s one, s two, sample standard deviations, we can also calculate sample size. We know our sample size and t value or our critical value. So based on the sample size and also based on is based on the confidence level. So if you have decided your confidence level, you should be able to get the good value. So we can have all the information or all the numbers that we need to co to construct this confidence interval. So in real practice, we don't have to uh, manually calculate the expression. So let's. Take a look at one example. So that's chapter 12, assignment question number two. Let's uh, see how we can calculate this question uh, using step one. So here's the question. Mm. Okay. So two neighborhoods. We will just compare the two neighborhoods. So developer wants to know if the houses in those different neighborhoods were built at the roughly same time. So we already discussed this uh, example. So we have so we have data table, we have a sample from the first neighborhood, we have a sample from the second neighborhood. Then we need to construct a confidence interval for the mean difference, mu1 minus mu2. A confidence interval. The confidence, confidence level is 95%. So let me open the, this data table in the slide prompt. So I have two column of data. Then let me go to stats, t stats, two sample with data. So we are not given summary data for this question, so we use with data. Stats, t stats, two sample with data. Then let's select neighborhood one as first sample, neighborhood two as the second sample. Five percent, twenty-five percent. Okay, we don't have to change the, with the default value. So define your sample size, sample one, sample two. Then select the confidence interval option and define your confidence level, and that's it. Compute. So we got the lower limit and upper limit. So any question on part one, the, the part one. So part B is there a within the confidence interval, uh, the lower limit is negative, the, the, the upper limit is positive, so it is in the index. So zero is in the interval, that's for sure. And the last question. What 
that the constant in there was just about the no hypothesis. That mean difference is zero. So based on the constant interval, based on the constant interval that we have, let me pull out this one. Based on this constant interval, we reject the no hypothesis. We reject the no hypothesis, or we fail to reject the no hypothesis. Well, this question is from chapter 12. I can ask similar question in chapter 10. Fail to reject. Why we fail to reject? Because zero is within your interval. So if zero is in your interval, what does that, that mean? That means zero could be a possible value for the true difference. So if zero is in your interval, that means this could be true. This could be the true mean difference. So you fail to reject. So you fail to reject the no hypothesis. You fail to reject the no hypothesis because the true mean, uh, this is a possible value for the true mean difference. So, but if the if zero is not in your constant interval, that means we reject the no hypothesis. So in this case, zero is in your interval. So we fail to reject. So let's be clear about the relationship between the constant interval and the hypothesis term. Although the, our result is up about the constant interval, we can use this result to make conclusions about our hypothesis term. Yes? You said um, if zero wasn't in the interval, you would say you would fail to reject. You would fail to reject because it's not inside the interval. It is inside the interval. So if, so l l l let me say that again. So if zero is in the interval, we fail to reject the no hypothesis. Because zero is, in the interval, that means zero is a possible true difference, it's a true mean difference. But there, if zero is not in the interval, that means zero is not a possible value. So we reject, then we reject this no hypothesis. Because zero is not a possible value based on our constant interval. Okay, let's see. So any other questions? is called paired t-test. So that's a, a special case of the two sample t-test. So it's called paired t-test. What, what is a paired data? So paired data means the observations or your samples are collected in pair. And those observations are highly related with, to each other. So for example, here, uh, so how many of you are interested in this uh, formula one? No? Okay. So probably the, this board is, is popular in Europe and in Asian countries. Um, it's okay. okay. So those two, the most two famous teams are Ferrari and Mercedes. So in recent years, Mercedes uh, is better than Ferrari, but uh, I'm a big fan of Anyway, so every year, so throughout the whole season, they have to compete in different countries, in US, in Canada, in Mexico, in Brazil, in China, in Japan, and so on and so forth. If I want to compare the performance of those two race cars, I have to do the testing, I have to do the sampling in different countries, because different countries have different tracks. For example, in Australia, I collect samples 
the average uh, speed of Ferrari is 95, and uh, the average speed for the, the time so per lap is for Mercedes uh, 94. I, by the way, I made up those, those I made up those numbers. Yeah, so they are not uh, the, the real number. And in China, I do the sampling. Again, in Russia, I collect sample from Ferrari and Mercedes in Canada and the US, I do the same. You see, I collect the samples or observations are collected in pairs. In the US, I collect samples for, from Ferrari and Mercedes. In Canada, I do the same, so it's in pairs. So those two values are collected in pairs. And then when we look at those, when we look at each pairs, so those two numbers are highly related because they are both from US. They're both from US. And those two numbers are both from Canada and they are from Russia, from China, and so on and so forth. <coughs> if I want to do some comparison, I can do this comparison. But I cannot compare this value with that value. Because those two numbers are from different countries. They're from different tracks. If you look at those two tracks, they have different designs. They have different lungs, they have different designs. So that means you cannot do this kind, you cannot do the cross comparison. It's not fair. Because some some tracks are longer, some tracks are shorter. Some tracks are designed for cars that have high absolute speed, but some are more suitable for cars that have better accelerations. So we cannot do this cross comparison. So this is a, an example of paired data. So this is a paired data. Uh, observations or samples are collect, collected in pairs. And those, so within each pair, the numbers are related. We cannot do the cross comparison. It's not fair. So that's paired data. Then the paired t-test is a hypothesis testing. So the mean, still we are comparing the mean. So the mean is not taking the average of the fir first column, taking the average of the second column, do the comparison, it's not that. It's the mean of the pairwise difference of the two groups. So that's a paired t-test. What, what does that mean? So we will get back to this assumption, but let's go to this slide for now. What is the pairwise difference? So we have the same data here. So what we need to do is to calculate the difference from each pair of the data. So Australia, let's calculate the difference. 95 minus 94, which is one. In China, 90, uh, 89 minus 92, that is negative one. We do the same for all the pairs. Then we have the, the fourth column, which is called difference. Then we calculate the average of this column. So that's our pairwise difference. That's our pairwise difference. So we are not taking the average of the first column, taking the, the average of the second column and do the comparison. That's, it's not like that. Then we want to do a hypothesis testing for the pairwise mean difference. So the setup, so I already have the setup here, how we can do the hypothesis testing. It's a little bit different. So this is the setup for the regular two sample t test. Mu1 minus mu2 is equal to zero, mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero, greater than or less. If we talk about the pairwise t test, the population parameter is mu d. Pairwise difference mean. Pairwise difference mean. It's not, there's no mu 1, but there's no mu 2. We only have one mu, which represents the pairwise difference of the uh, of, of the mean of, from two groups. Then, this one, let's assume it's equal to zero. The pairwise difference is equal to zero. Let's ignore hypothesis. For alternative, we still have not equal to or greater than or less. So that's a pairwise difference. Mean, pairwise mean difference. So the setup is a bit different. So that's for the 
regular two sample uh, two sample t test, and this is pair uh, pair t test. Yes. Or the difference. So delta t is the pairwise difference. So in most cases, the pairwise difference or the delta is equal to zero. So in this case, I just use zero. But for for general expression, you can use the, the, the delta zero. So it, so in most cases, the delta zero is equal to zero. Uh, delta is equal to zero. And then we do the hypothesis testing. That the logic, the procedure is the same. We calculate the Test statistic. We then we put the test statistic into a t distribution, and then we find the p value. Compare the p value with alpha level. That's that's the old story. Then here's the expression for the t statistic. The t statistic is equal to so the first one is d bar. What is d bar? Yes, d bar is the mean of the differences. So we have one column called difference. If you take the average of this column, that, that, that's your d-bar. That is your d-bar. So that's, that's, that, that is the value that we can calculate based on our sample data. So that's not a problem for us. Delta zero, as we discussed, in multiple cases, it's it, it, uh, it's zero. So we can just, normally we can just ignore this term because it's zero. Over the standard error. So standard error is equal to S of d. Average at the d bar as is the standard deviation of this column. So if you have this additional column, you can find the, the standard deviation. Mm, well, square root of n, so that's we know our sample size, so that's all we need to know. We have all the information, then we calculate the t and do the put it into the t curve, find the p value, and compare the p value with r bar. That's it. Then if we go back, so there are some assumptions we have to make. The very first is that we have to make sure our data are paired data. So we collect data in pairs, in pairs, in pairs. So that's the first assumption. And two more assumptions, independent assumption that we already discussed those two assumptions uh, in the previous chapter. So we have to randomly select the, our sample. The sample size cannot be more than 10% of your population. And we have to make sure if we, the sample size is small, like less than 15, we have to make sure the population data is, is normally distributed. If our sample size is uh, large enough, say sample size is greater than 40, so we don't have to worry about the uh, So those are the... Uh, the, the three assumptions that we discussed in the previous chapter. And you don't have to take um, um, time on this slide. So let's see one example. So this example is in your assignment. <coughs> this question has multiple parts. So let's pay attention. Because if you do not pay attention, you may need to spend a lot of time in this question. Question number six. Question number six. A supermarket chain wants to know if their buy one get one free campaign increases customer traffic enough to justify the cost of the program. So they selected ten stores. Then from each of the stores, they selected two days. One day, they use this buy one get one free campaign or strategy, and then they they record uh, the tra uh, sorry, not traffic for the the, 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 the customer uh, the, how many customers came, and then the other day they do not implement this buy one get one free. Then they also record the uh, the customer traffic. So what they want is. They want to test the hypothesis that there's no mean difference 
in the traffic against alternative that the program, the buy one get one free program, increases the mean customer traffic. So that's what they want to do. And they are given, so they give us uh, the data. So for each of the four, we have the number of customers with program and without program. So the first, first question will be, you have to, we have to identify if those data are paired data or not. So we have column data, so for each of the four, So one way to see if the, da the data are paired or not is to do a cross comparison. So let's try to compare this number with program from row one with this number. So this number is without program from four to. Let's see if this comparison makes sense or not. If it doesn't make sense, probably that's paired data. So if we do this comparison in this, in this application, it does at least to me it doesn't make sense. Because there are those numbers are from two to four. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And in this case, the data are paired. So that's so because the measurement of the customer was taken at each store twice. So they are collected in pairs. And once during the program and once without the program. So that's that's pair data. So that's the first thing we have to um, figure out. So that's pair data. So we are talking about pair data. Then we have to we have to do some calculation. So D bar, we have to calculate the D bar. We are given the data. So let's let me open this data table in a sidebar. Open it. So we need to start our calculation right now. So D bar. Let's do this. We have to do a hypothesis test. So let's click stat. T stat. Not to sample, not to sample this time. It's called pair because that's we're dealing with pair data. That's just that pair. So if you click on it, um, then we need to select our sample. The first sample with program, sample two without program. Then here's the thing. Let's select this option. Save different things. Let's check this option. Save different things. So we will I will show you why we select this option. So let's select it for now. Uh, save different things. And we need to do a hypothesis testing. Mu D. So mu D is equal to zero. Uh, because we don't know there's no mean difference. So it's a no hypothesis. And in the alternative hypothesis, should we choose not equal to or greater than or less than? Hmm? So should we, should we select not equal to or greater than or less than in, for your alternative hypothesis? Greater than. Why do we select greater than? So we have to go back to the first question. So against the alternative that the program increases the customer or the mean customer traffic, the keyword is increases. That means with a new program, we want to see the new program increases the customer traffic. So it should be greater than. I think that's it. So select your two samples and check the save differences option and define your no and alternative hypothesis. Simply good. So here's our output screen though. Um, 
Sketchy stuff, the Twitter freedom, we have a lot of things here, but we're not using those numbers for this session. We are calculating the DB bar. So you will notice we have one more column in differences. So that's uh, that's why we select this save differences option. Then after you click compute, it will generate the new column for the difference. Then we need to deal with this column because we want to know the mean of the differences. So let's go to let's work on this column. So go to the stat summary stats column. Stats summary stats column. So let's select the differences column. And the question is asking for the mean. mean we have the standard deviation so the mean is a d bar so it's equal to one one there and i see so that's a standard deviation so we already did the calculation we just copy the number and paste it here two decimal places We are done with with this. So let's close it. So the next question is asking for the standard error. So we have to go back to the previous, so the first calculation we did, the hypothesis test. Let's click the stats from uh, result. Uh, so let's select the first calculation we did. Okay, so here's the output. Standard error, we have a standard error here. So that's the number the, 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 the let's copy and paste two decimal places 1.99 t statistic we have the t statistic here so we just copy and paste and degrees of freedom one-sided or two-sided? Because it, we selected greater than, so that means it's one-sided alternative. So one-sided, uh, one-sided because the supermarket chain wants to know if traffic is greater. So that's one-sided. Because we selected greater than. And I think we have one here. Um, okay, p-value. or fail to reject no hypothesis. Here's our p value. Here's our alpha level. So p value, in this case, is greater than alpha level. We do not reject, we fail to reject no hypothesis because the p value is greater than alpha level. If p value is less than alpha level, we reject the, the no hypothesis. Otherwise, we fail to reject. Do we have sufficient evidence or we do not have sufficient evidence? Insufficient. If we fail to reject, that means we do not have enough evidence. If we have enough evidence, we would reject the no hypothesis. So that's why we select there's insufficient. So that's all about this question. So we, 
I think that's the, the, the longest question that uh, we have we have ever received. But uh, for most of the parts, uh, we can get the numbers from the algorithm. So we don't have to do a lot of calculation. We just copy the, the output from the background to do. Uh, I already upload. I already uploaded a video for that question. So if you uh, if you didn't uh, write down all the procedures, please refer to that video. So uh, one video, I I think I I worked through the whole class. All right. So let's do our quiz. Uh, I think we have enough time to do the quiz. So no calculation is needed. No calculation is needed. So this one is similar to the previous quiz. Uh, I only need two things. One is to set up the, the hypothesis, the known and the alternative. Then the next one is to tell me if your alternative one-sided or two-sided. 